please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Let's talk about the market action. Bank stocks dragged the market in the second half but a ended off highs led by id stocks the nifty closed about two fifths of a percent in the red sensex managed to hold on to 35,000, 34,500 actually banks saw a sharp fall led by cici bank that index closed with cuts of about a percent the mid caps ended with cuts of 81 points anuj singhal is here with a wrap of the day's trading action hi anuj uh, take us through why we saw a disappointing set across most of the major indices well, disappointing day for the bulls. Despite the last 30 minutes sort of pullback, uh, the market was down. There was no breakdown, but on the bank nifty, there's a bit of a uh, sense of a breakdown that you saw uh, today. Uh, IT, of course, fought back for the bulls a bit. Uh, uh, the money market made big moves today, I, currency in particular, uh, uh, and that, of course, had an impact on the overall market as well. So banks were down, ICICI, Indescent, SBI, and Access ahead of numbers. Uh, Metals and other commodities were down, Vedanta, HP, Gale, Tata Steel, IOC, and even Maruti was down, which was quite interesting. But ITs doing heavy lifting for the bulls, TCS in particular, uh, once again, uh, close to that $100 billion market cap, These Tech Mahindra and HCL Tech were higher. Other index gainers included names like Bharti Airtel, Mahindra and Mahindra and Power Grid. Outside the index, PC Jeweler, something was wrong there on that stock, 15% lower, Hathway and Lemon Tree were the other ones which were down. And FNO gainers today included names like NIIT Tech, Raymond, and DHFL. All in all, uh, we'll have to say that the bulls would, would be disappointed considering the kind of start that they had. The closing uh, was a bit disappointing. Okay, fair enough, Anuj. Before uh, uh, we get you the action from Min Street, very quick uh, mention of the Wipro guidance. Wipro has guided for Q1 revenues to come in in the range of 2015 to 2065 million dollars. Big disappointment there. We were expecting it to be between 0.5 to 2.5 percent growth. Instead, they're expecting a decline in Q1 of negative 2.3 percent to a little bit of increase of 0.1 percent. Big disappointment. We will get the management uh, later in the day. But uh, yes, let's talk about the action from the currency market. The Indian rupee weakened to a 14-month low against the U.S. dollar and is currently trading at 66.75 versus the dollar. Let's bring in Lata to put this into perspective. Lata, what is the reason for this consistent weakness that we have seen in the Indian rupee? Oh, well, uh, there have been uh, historical reasons, obviously, with uh, crude rising to $70, $75 and uh, threatening to take the trade deficit as well as the current account deficit higher. But uh, more recently, of course, uh, with the... U.S. Treasury, 10-year Treasury, yield touching 3%, plus the dollar strengthening. I mean, remaining, say, the dollar index at 1991. There has been a general risk of actually, across emerging markets. Uh, uh, actually, today, uh, after this 3% on the U.S. Uh, Treasury, which is the first time since 2014 that the yield has gone to 3%, you've seen an across-the-board sell in equities in Asia and Europe as well. Most currencies have slipped against the dollar. It's just that India is slipping even more because it is a current account deficit country. It's one of the uh, countries with a slightly higher current account deficit. So this is the sharpest one-day fall in two months or something like that. And it is a 14-month low for the Indian currency. Uh, the expectation or at least the chatter among uh, the trading rooms is that at 66.82 thereabouts, uh, the Reserve Bank uh, looks like has sold a bit of dollars. But uh, it's, it's, it looks like it's a very tentative sell. Uh, rupee is uh, likely to remain weak, but uh, there are a lot of people who believe that it has weakened enough over the past uh, couple of weeks. And now perhaps uh, uh, crude at 74 uh, is pretty much factored in uh, in the uh, dollar rupee. Further weakness from here at current fundamentals is not expected. Okay, fair enough, Lata. Thanks for joining in and putting that into perspective. But let's uh, get the big story from the real estate space. The Maharashtra government cleared Mumbai's long pending development plan yesterday. The blueprint will pave the way for the maximum city to have more land available for building homes and commercial spaces. Remember, an earlier version of the spaces. Remember, an earlier version of the development plan was released in 2015, a few months after the BJP Sena government taking charge in Maharashtra. The plan, however, faced criticism from several NGOs and activists over some key aspects. Let's bring in Manisha Natarajan to put this into perspective. Manisha, the revised plan finally getting the government's approval. Take us through some of the key highlights that stand out. 
Well, indeed, it is a big day for Mumbai with the Mumbai Development Plan 2034 being finalized by the government. Two things which come out strongly. A, the government is serious about creating an affordable housing stock, which it has failed to do so far with either slum redevelopment or bringing down land prices in the city. Now, in the DP, it's proposed that 2,100 hectares of no development zone will be released for affordable housing, plus 330 hectares of salt pans will also be made available to create affordable housing. While this is lower than what was being anticipated, Anticipated a release of 3,700 hectares is still quite a substantial amount or number for the island city. What's even more important is that FSI norms have now been increased. FSI for commercial has gone up to 5 from the current 2.66. FSI for residential has increased from 1.33 to 3. The municipal commissioner at the press conference announced that the new Mumbai DP intends to ensure that the city creates 8 million new jobs by 2034. In fact, two decades ago, the city had taken a decision to move commerce out to the suburbs and perhaps lost out to cities like Bengaluru for best in IT and office spaces. So this is a move which will be be welcomed a lot by top developers like Raheja, Godrej, Hiranandani, etc. A critical point to note is that eco-sensitive zones, the mangrove area specifically, have been earmarked as natural resources and will not be open to construction. RA Colony has also been preserved. The final plan, of course, will be kept open for a few more weeks for public suggestions or any big flaws to be pointed out. But most important to note is that there is skepticism amongst urban planners who have said that the release of land will not be sufficient to create affordable housing stock. The government has empty coffers as of now, so who really will make these houses? is a big question. Back to you. Oh, absolutely. That is the question indeed. Who will make these houses exactly? Thanks, Samanisha, for putting that into perspective. We will take a very, very short break on that note. But up ahead, the bidding war for Fortis has intensified a day ahead of the end of the deadline to submit bids. Status check on the other side. Welcome back. The bidding war for Fortis has intensified a day ahead of the end of the deadline to submit bids for the healthcare company. There are two more suitors that seem to be in the fray. Radian, backed by KKR, and Malaysia's IHH have also entered the race for Fortis. Nisha Poddar is here with a comprehensive check of who the bidders are at this point in time and what they have to bring on the table. Nisha. Fortis Healthcare clearly in a bind with this particular uh, suitor and the bin, by, uh, bidding war that's going on. Now, there are four uh, suitors already in the race. It's the Manipal TPG, which revised its offer, as well as IHH and Radiant came back with binding offers. Now, 26th is when the board is supposed to meet. The advisory panel is meeting today to decide on it and advise the board. But it would be difficult to come to a conclusion so soon, is my understanding. Now, now, Manipal TPG, that revised the offer coming in and also included an open offer we may, which may just go down very well with the shareholders who have to take the final call. So, 121 rupees per share will be the minimum that they are going to pay for. Remember, only the hospital business of Fortis Healthcare. What they have also done is address the cash uh, situation and for that up to 1,000 odd crore rupees with 750 crore rupees of letter of intent and 250 crore rupees from SRL's 5% stake buy is what they have intended to do and 160 rupees per share is the implied valuation. Let's take it to another bid. IHH, Malaysian company, global giant, but has been extremely conservative. Only 650 crore rupees in terms of upfront payment and the rest of 3,350 crore rupees only after a strict due diligence exclusivity and two board seats so that's a tough one apart from that radiant let's go to that one that has revised its offer in terms of valuations it seeks to be higher than all the other bidders but remember there are many ifs and buts over there 170 to 175 rupees per share contingent on srl's valuation which is not even part of the deals all they are looking at is buying out the entire hospital business and they are offering 1200 crore rupees upfront which is uh, by buying Mulloon project which is under RHT. It could be a little complicated affair. Apart from that, Munjal and Barman, that's going to be an important one, 1,500 crore rupees and upfront of about 1,000 crore rupees. So we still have to see like-to-like -like comparison in terms of stock perform stock valuation is something that the shareholders will watch out for. But equally important will be the due diligence timeline. And that particular table should also come up for you that who are really looking at a due diligence. So it's not Manipal TPG, not Muljan Barman, but IHH as well as Radiant.
these are the two contenders who are really looking at a due diligence so apart from share price due diligence as well as the construct of the deal which is going to be extremely important but it will be a difficult task because we'll have to see because Manipal TPG has um, a right to match in five days so that could be given to them and there's every likelihood that the final decision may not be tomorrow itself okay fair enough Nisha thanks for joining in with that comprehensive outlook on who is currently in the race but let's uh, get to the latest in the SR steel case now so also say banks open bids submitted by Arsenal Mittal and New Metal in the first round in a marathon meeting of the committee of creditors yesterday but are yet to come to a conclusion about the eligibility of both the players under section 29A Ritu Singh is here with details Ritu, what does this mean now which are the two players that have an edge so far well, you know, Kritika, it's back to square one in the SRC case where lenders will have to examine both the bids submitted in the first round. That's what they did, uh, did in the marathon meetings that were held yesterday. Both New Metal and ArcelorMittal bids were opened by the lenders and examined. Uh, obviously, more documentation is sought in terms of establishing eligibility of both the players under Section 29A, and that process is still underway. But that said, we understand that Arcelor's bid was far higher than what New Metal had put on the table. In fact, we understand that Arcelor's uh, package includes around 38,000 crore rupees of repayment of which about 28,500 is what they'll be paying the financial creditors. In the case of New Metal, the offer is about 19,000 plus another 5,000 crores uh, from internal uh, internal accruals, which is not really counted by the banker. So 17,000 repayment to the lenders is what we're looking at in the second offer. But, you know, both of these bids first have to be examined for eligibility. In the meanwhile, some lenders also feel that they're constrained by the NCLT order for examining only these two bids for the lack of time to invite fresh bids. So therefore, there is a possibility that they they could challenge this order in a higher court, that is the NCLAT, uh, to ensure that they can seek a second round of bids and get a better valuation. Okay, fair enough. So back to square one for now at least. Taridu will be following this very closely and we will have updates uh, as and when anything develops. But uh, from one exclusive to another, and this one's from the GST corner, we learn from sources that the GST Council is likely to hold its next meeting on the 4th of May. The most important issue slated for discussion is converting the goods and services tax network from a private entity to a public entity. What does this mean? Timzi Jaipuria is here with the details. Timzi, what's on the agenda? As you rightly mentioned, the council is next going to meet on May 4, and this time it is going to be meeting through a video conferencing. As we know, a finance minister is not keeping well. That's the prime reason for holding the meeting through video conferencing. And on the agenda is a, a very crucial part uh, that is converting GSTN from uh, a private entity to a public entity. The proposal that is under consideration right now is to hold about 51% stake by the central government itself. Now, let's see what actually happens happens in the council meeting where the council agrees for a 51 percent public entity or a 100 percent public entity is something that we need to wait and see for 4th of May. Apart from that, very crucial, the government is now planning to give the digital uh, incentives uh, for, to both consumers and the sellers. The government wants to incentivize digital transactions uh, under the GST regime. Remember, in the 23rd meeting of GST Council, this was placed as, as a table, uh, table agenda. And this time again, the council is going to meet to further decide on it. A council is likely to give an in-principle nod to digital transactions, incentivizing digital transactions for both consumers and the sellers. About 2% of incentive is likely to be given. And not just this, government is seeing going to see an abo about uh, 25,000 odd crore rupees of annual outgo if government goes ahead on this proposal. So government is now going to give an in-principle nod. Then it will be for the GST implementation committee to finalize the contours, how to do it. For consumers, it is most likely going to be cashbacks, immediate cashbacks of 2%. But for the sellers, government is yet to decide whether to give them a rebate in the income tax return or in the GST filing returns. Not just that, apart from this, government is also going to go ahead and finalize the GST form. Remember, we are right now under 3B form and government is likely to give, her, not give a nod to the fusion form, which will be a fusion of Nandan Nilakini model and the model suggested by the GST committee. Okay. All in, it is going to be a power pack meeting yet again. Oh, absolutely. And, and of course, we will have to be tracking this very closely. Uh, thank you so much, Timzi, for joining in with that. We will take a quick break on that note. But up next, the centre shoots off notices to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica for the second time. Exclusive details on the other side.
KMBC TV 18 and this is After the Bell. Now, the centre has shot off notices to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica for the second time, seeking more details on the data breed scandal. Now, remember, Cambridge Analytica had been accused of accessing over 87 million Facebook users' data. In an unauthorised way, the entire episode has also raised questions on Facebook's privacy laws as well. Ritu Panabhuyan is here with the details. Ritu, what exactly are you picking up in terms of the missive that the government has sent so far? The second set of queries have been sent by Ministry of IT uh, to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica as uh, the, the, the replies that both these uh, companies had sent uh, uh, on, on the first notice uh, were not found to be satisfactory. Both the, com both the com companies have been asked to reply on, to this new set of uh, queries by 10th of May. Uh, on Facebook, uh, the queries raised by uh, Ministry of IT uh, includes uh, if, uh, the, 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 if Facebook has implemented uh, uh, any measures uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, that security architecture uh, protects data related to Indians, uh, if any such unauthorized use of data is known to Facebook, and if it is known what uh, steps Facebook has taken to stall it immediately, moreover information uh, of Facebook, the extent of data collected by Facebook, uh, as well as the uh, authorization mechanism for apps uh, that collect data from Facebook. As far as Cambridge Analytica is concerned, um, uh, Ministry of IT has uh, told the company that uh, their uh, earlier response was cri cryptic and it seems that the intention was to conceal more than reveal and the admissions made by the Facebook CEO have their own sanctity and, and cannot be wished away by ca Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica have been asked uh, uh, about what kind of data has been collected in India concerning Indians, whether uh, Cambridge Analytica has harvested any data uh, uh, related to third party apps uh, that is directly or indirectly you know that indirectly or indirectly possesses data from Facebook and while harvesting any such data uh, you know if, if uh, uh, consent was taken from people in India uh, we'll have to now wait and see if uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook get back uh, gets back to uh, uh, Ministry of uh, IT regarding this new set of query queries which have been raised with that it's back to you Okay, Rituparna, fair enough. Uh, we will get uh, an CNBC TV 18 exclusive interview now. The RBI Circular ordering all payment companies to store Indian transaction data within the country's boundaries will definitely cause disruption. That's the word coming in from Mastercard's Asia Pacific co president, Ari Sarkar. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18's Karen Lee, Ari Sarkar also said that the demonetization push continues to help digital payment companies and that Mastercard remains very bullish on the country. Here's a slice of that interview. Let me state in a completely unequivocal sense that demonetization's positive impact on the digital economy growth uh, remains extremely strong. If you look at cash circulation in the economy pre-demonetization, used to run at roughly around 12.5% of GDP. We're seeing that has come down to around 8.8% percent, so close to about 9%. Now that's a very significant reduction of cash in circulation, so that's a very positive impact of demonetization. If you're looking at MasterCard's business uh, here in India, uh, when you look at qu the, the quarterly volumes of MasterCard on a pre-demonetization period, Hmm. Our volumes at the end of uh, this, this quarter is not significantly off from that peak volume. Does MasterCard have big plans to get into the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, space anytime soon? Are you in talks well, you with know, other players? We, we are doing a lot uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer space and, and a lot of that is happening at a global level and many of that global innovation is going to come to India. Peer-to-peer -peer payment capability, powering up WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, all of this capability is already live in the U.S. You mentioned that you're still in talks with the Reserve Bank of India. In its current form, the demands that they have that within six months, all transaction data should be moved into India's boundaries. Is that tenable without this friction coming into the picture like you mentioned? Well, there's obviously going to be some disruption. You know, it'll be hard to say, but I, I would not like to conjecture at this stage because this is a fairly complex topic. Uh, what needs to get mirrored to India, what needs to get stored, uh, those are details that one is still you know, working through. Last question on this and then I promise we'll move on. But currently, how much of that data is already stored in India? Is there any part of it or is it completely stored also? Well, a, lo a lot of that data is already stored in India because if you look at, you know, when we move transactions from point A to point B, uh, we have our what we call MIPS, MasterCard Interface Processors, which actually interacts between banks in the India market itself. So, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but there are transactional information which is already residing locally from MIP to MIP. Okay, let's talk a little long term then. So when MasterCard India looks at India in 
2025. Is it much more optimistic now than it was before demonetization? And how will this reflect in investments made in India or plans for expansion in India? You know, we remain extremely bullish on India. I think India has been a country that we have been present for many decades. We have invested in the last three years over $550 million in India. We remain extremely uh, aggressively pursuing more growth in India. Okay, so despite the ups and downs, MasterCard is confident that India growth will continue. We'll take a quick commercial break. When we return, a special report from Polbound Karnataka where silk prices have become a key issue in some constituencies. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Now, accounting for 49% of India's raw silk production, Ramnagra in Karnataka is the country's silk production hub. But the silk industry here is not happy with the reduction of import duty on Chinese silk. Prices in the market have come crashing down as part of a special series on the Karnataka elections. CNBC TV 18's Rukmini Rao and Archana Shukla report on the economic issues which will count across Karnataka. Ram Nagra, on the outskirts of Bengaluru, is home to 30,000 families whose livelihoods depend on silk farming and allied activities. But the economy here is hurting. A reduction in the import duty on Chinese silk has meant that farmers here have lost their pricing power. I'm at the sericulture hub of Karnataka here in Ramanagara, one of the biggest auction houses as you can see, where business of close to two crores uh, takes place on a daily basis. and. Uh, Farmers come here to auction off their cocoons. If our farmers prosper, the nation will also prosper. When our farmers are growing enough, they should stop importing silk from China. We have the ability to grow how much ever needed. Farmers here must be supported to grow more. Ramnagra is a stronghold of the JDS and is also one of the constituencies from where its chief ministerial candidate H.D. Kumaraswamy is fighting the election. He is also contesting from the neighbouring Channapatna, which also happens to be a sericulture hub. Kumaraswamy is promising schemes and packages worth over 20,000 crore rupees for the welfare of silk farmers. The party in power, the Congress, doesn't want to be left behind. The recently announced state budget promised a 6% rise in outlay for sericulture and related activities. It has also proposed setting up a state silk development centre and a silk museum to give silk-driven tourism a boost, Kisan nursery scheme to encourage cultivation of mulberry trees and providing subsidies amounting to nearly 90% of the cost of cultivating these trees. Farmers say that while some of these schemes have helped, it is not nearly enough. The government is giving sericulture equipment under subsidy. However, the 50 rupees bonus that they used to provide has been stopped and we want the government to bring it back. A lot of benefits have been taken away. Farmers are not getting much. Schemes are not reaching the end farmers. Well, the farmers do agree that several of the government schemes have benefited them, but their problems are far from being solved to an extent that they had expected. The fact that this constituency gave H.D. Kumaraswamy the thumbs up in the 2013 elections and as chief ministerial candidate from JDS this time, the expectations that he will deliver if he wins are a lot higher. With Rukmini Rao in Ram Nagra, in Mumbai, Archana Shukla. And we'll of course continue to get you our special series from Karnataka election. But for now, we'll have to end this edition of After the Bell. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Ritu will be joining in on the other side with reporter's diary and the top stories of the day. Stay tuned.